Yes. My name is Shanice Reynolds. I'm a parent of a student at a school that did not close. It was one of the four that was saved. Um, the, you're talking about our children and our communities as if they're numbers. These are actual people. Your data should come from the community, the students, the parents, the people who work within those schools. The truth is the welcoming schools, I'm not gonna say they're not so welcome, but CPS divided our communities divided our schools when we had to fight for our school and go against another school, go against our other brothers and sisters in solidarity. We could not just stand up and talk for our schools. We had to speak against other schools to prove a point that our school is better. Mm -hmm. So you divided and segregated our communities. But our, the welcoming schools and the current schools do not have all the resources that are needed. And we know that you all, CPS, need to change the culture of CPS, and you can't do that by closing schools, disrupting families, and disrupting communities. Okay. What are you gonna do to change the culture of CPS without closing schools, firing teachers, and forcing families out of their safe havens? Well, as I mentioned, there's a five-year moratorium now, and we're focusing on improving that culture. The five-year moratorium, excuse me for cutting you off, is to close schools. Not right. closed schools. We know that closing right. schools let, let, does not. Okay. You're asking what finish, are we doing not to disrupt? Answer. There's not going to be any more disruption, uh, and, and work with the system we have to improve the culture. We're taking costs out of central office. We're trying to get as much with funds a new to those schools. And new furniture. I'm costs sorry. Out of let, him, let him. Let him. Fin let him finish his answer, like, and then if, if you want to comment, you can. Yes. Um, and so that's the focus. An office like OS4, focusing on working with those schools and making sure that we're not. The closing is not the answer. We've got to make sure that the rising tide is going to raise all boats. You speak and that of is the OS4 focus. and Gresham School that was just turned around, begged and pleaded to be a part of OS4. And Barbara Bird Bennett, David Vitale, we sat at the table with them and they said, you can't apply to be part of OS4. That's part of the state. The state have to, has to approve that. Yes, out their mouths. Uh, well, again, it didn't come out of my mouth, so I'm not exactly sure what the context of the conversation would have been, but uh, I'm not clear on that. Gresham answer. School was on a list to be closed. Mm -hmm. Gresham School was also on a list to be co-located, mm -hmm. and then they turned it around and turned it over to AUSL, but prior to that, we had a plan. We had an improvement plan for the school. The community agreed, the students agreed, the teachers agreed, and said, how about we work with the people who are within the school, sure. not fire the teachers, not move the students, but okay. supply the resources and the funding that you would give to those schools. Our schools are not equally funded. We speak about the north side, the west side, the south they side. They are, in fact, equally funded. They don't have they e are. equally funded with resources. And you, you know may that not we want to believe it, but in fact, they not, are. My son does not have a librarian at his school. That's the, your, they do that not principal have has the autonomy to choose what staff he but or she wants to have. But the autonomy that okay. the principals need is better autonomy with you all, not with the finances. Maybe it's maybe They yes. should not be picking and choosing do they have to buy toilet paper or books, and that's what's happening in but our everybody school. Everybody okay. gets the same amount of resources based right. on the students students they have. We have to move on. Over here. As charters do as well. So the social media team behind the school project um, has been collecting Twitter questions and they will continue collecting Twitter questions. Um, so please keep, and on Facebook also, so please keep um, putting your questions in um, through the whole process tonight and um, all the rest of the events. But two that we want to make sure are addressed. Um, Tweeted in from at Craig Cunningham on Twitter are what were some practical and affordable alternatives to the Chicago school closings? And then also um, at Catalyst Chicago Magazine, uh, how many students from closed schools are still unaccounted for? Okay. First question was practical alternatives to school closings. Um, well, Jesse, again, you just, just uh, you would dissipate the funding and dilute the funding more and spend, instead of concentrating it on school buildings and students where they are uh, and being able to spend it on other things that we think are important uh, and it would go into maintaining all these other buildings. And sometimes you'd have all these uh, extra custodial staff and all these, it's not just teachers, it's all the other engineers and things that go to maintain a building. Uh, you've got to snow plow it in the wintertime, you've got to mow the lawn, you've got to maintain it. There's a lot of costs <laughs> that go into these things. So... We'll start you with something up on All the screen. Right. <laughs> Is that better? Or are you missing back here? Okay. G G2, you... Um, and this is... I just want to share with people. This is before um, Jesse joined the board. 
But the, the reasons for closing schools has, has rotated, and it's really what's most effective to, to, to get you know, the desired outcome. In 2004, they said it was for utilization and for performance. Mayor Rahm Emanuel switches reasons whenever he's answering the question. He was just interviewed last week and he, when he was being challenged about the schools, and he said, I can't keep children in failing schools. I think what's not being talked about is, and we did a study with the University of Illinois Chicago in 2007. The study was called uh, Children as Collateral Damage. And we studied uh, the impact of school closings on receiving schools in four different schools in Bronzeville. So this is not a lesson that is brand new. This is a practice that has had the same outcome since, since, and I'm gonna go back to 2003, 2004, because it is not a different agenda. The punitive approach to school uh, improvement, where schools are punished based on whatever their test scores are, is the same, it will produce the same result as the, the uh, per student funding formulas. Because okay. in schools that may only have three or 400 children, they do not have the resources to effectively meet those students' need. As was said earlier, parents, schools are deciding on whether they, they, they're getting toilet paper out of their own money. So the schools are being starved. And in a few years, at the end of the moratorium, there'll be a bunch of schools lined up to be closed, and then there'll be a new rationale. Because the people making the decisions don't have to live with the impact. And so I think that we have to be politically astute enough, even if the people making the decisions aren't, even if they're in a, they are spoke in a wheel that they don't control, they need to understand that there is a, a formula to good schools. It is not a mystery. I've been blessed. What is, what is it, in, in brief? What's the formula? Okay, I, I assisted, I was on a team with uh, Laverne Bailey at Fuller Elementary School. In 1991, Fuller was on What's Wrong with America's Schools and CNN. When she became the principal, she said we wanted a curriculum that did three things, culturally relevant, engaging, and challenging. And she did that. Mm -hmm. um, she said that there has to be effective wraparound support for every child. She had the autonomy to not uh, be driven by, uh, to, to, to use, she said she wanted to focus on teaching mm -hmm. and not standardized tests. Mm -hmm. So she did constant training for her teachers. Her veteran teachers were mentors to the younger teachers. So they were leadership teams in the school. Appropriate wraparound supports for every child. Mm -hmm. So a wraparound supports are more than just. Um, and there uh, has been some of that. CPS has well, well, engaged me, in some of that. Wraparound, right? wraparound supports are more than just a library, a school nurse, okay. a counselor. Right. They're opportunities for inspiration. Schools should be able to have debate teams, robotic clubs, things like that. The school newspapers. Those are wraparound supports. Mm -hmm. And and finally, transformative parent and community engagement, where the wisdom in the community is respected, and parents and community members and students are engaged as partners mm -hmm. in their education. Yeah. There's a common link okay. from. 1995 to today, there's a common link, and that has been the ignoring of the voices of the people that are directly impacted. We've it's heard that. Like, we've heard that. Just, I mean, I don't, I don't want to tonight. forget that that there is a mechanism. There's local school councils in, enacted since 1988, and and frankly, we can't get enough parents and community members to run for all the slots. That's because Chicago Public Schools. Whoa, whoa. That's because Chicago Public. Even your former board president Rufus Williams said, and Chicago Public Schools actually enacted legislation at the state to make local school councils advisory. So they have worked consistently. They have Hire the principal, they set the budget. Let me finish. They've worked consistently, Chicago Public Schools as an institution has worked consistently to misinform and miseducate parents about their responsibilities as LSC members. We, so which is why Coco developed the first cadre of parents to be LSC trainers, because Rev. Reverend Michael Bland and other people were lying to parents in local schools, telling them they didn't have okay. the ability to do certain things. So no, Chicago Public Schools has never supported I, I, local I wanna, school I want to get well, back. I, I, I want to get back to the conversation with the audience. The and and I, I, I wanted to. I wanted to. Uh, we've been talking a lot about politics tonight. I wanted to acknowledge uh, one of the, uh, one of our political leaders. Who's is that? Chewy sitting up in the front here. <laughs> Chewy, would you, would you like to stand up and? Chewy Garcia, and, and politics is a very real part of this conversation, whether it's local school councils, whether it's elected school board, whether it's who our mayor is, so it's just something to keep in mind. Uh, up, uh, up here for the next question, please. Hi, this is for Jesse Louise. This is Kenneth Newman. Um, we have a governor that favors charter schools. 
We have a new uh, chairman of the State Board of Education, uh, a reverend who, whose views on charter schools are pretty scary to some of us. Um, what is CPS going to do about the potential for new charter schools in Chicago, especially since so many of the charter schools that have been built were built without playgrounds and athletic fields, which contributes to child obesity and now has become a national security issue for the Pentagon. Thank you. Well, that's a, that's a handful. Not, not the schools themselves, but the <laughs> obesity issue. I, I got you. Um, you're, you're right. I mean, it's a different climate in this state uh, now, perhaps. Um, there is now, a couple of years ago, there was a law passed that now we don't have the full autonomy to decide whether or not we want to put a charter in, in our city or not. We're still an authorizer, but now there's a state authorizer that can veto, in essence, or override our decision. In fact, they did that last year. We you know, said we're not going to give you a charter, and the state went ahead and did that. So that just complicates lives because in that case, that charter is not answerable to us at all. We have no control of it. We've got to give it money from, from uh, CPS coffers, but we have no control and there's no accountability, all that. Frankly, not something I'm too thrilled with as a CPS board member. Why wasn't that thrilled when it was proposed? Because ISBE used to be that uh, appellate court to decide if a district didn't grant a charter. And in every case, we had an appeal come to us when I was chairman of the State Board of Education. We granted it, so I don't think we were being capricious, but those powers were taken away from the State Board of Education and granted to this independent authorizer. And so it is a concern because they then can put those schools wherever they want and either exacerbate some of our um, issues that we've had that, that, that you know, is the reason for why we're all here this evening uh, or help it in terms of putting it in a place where we need extra capacity. With that, we're going to have to wrap up the panel. I really appreciate the great wisdom and comments and, and, and uh, ideas that we heard up on this stage. You want to continue this conversation. Thanks to all of you for your comments and questions. And I want to ask uh, Rachel Dixon, the supervisor producer for the School Project, and Skylar Dees, a producer with Free Spirit Media, to come up here to wrap us up. Thanks to the panel. Everyone, clearly we have a lot to talk about. This was a great discussion. I want to encourage people to keep talking. This is just the second of six events and, and more. You know, we have a lot to come with the school project. Um, education, public education, you know, we feel like it's the foundation of a democracy and we're really working to keep the dialogue going. So we have a lot of ways you guys can engage with us, um, social media, online, outside. Uh, people are taking notes, so you can write down the answers to those three questions about um, the school closings, what you feel um, happened to Chicago, and how are we going to move forward from this. And um, yeah, so really, we want you to stay involved. You can share your stories. We have a partnership with StoryCorps. So if you have a personal story about education and your experience, you want to record it, you can go down to the Cultural Center mention the school project and we can post it on our website. It might be on national public radio. We want to hear from you. We want to encourage this discussion. I'm sorry that we can't go to midnight, but I think people would get tired and <laughs> they want to go home. Um, I, uh, so I want to um, introduce Skylar real quick to talk about our next segment and then a few more, 30 seconds more, and then you can go home. Thank you, Rachel. Hi, my name is Skylar Dees and I'm a part of Free Spirit Media. And I'm a producer of the next segment within the school's project a series called Restoring Justice. And that will be just basically premiering at the North Lawndale College Prep Collins campus on Thursday, March 5th. And our documentary essentially just chronicles moving from punitive practices in education that goes against students, that goes against everything that is imaginable and in society. And then it shows how much diligently we can work towards improving an effort for more youth-centered and restorative practices implemented in school systems. So we look forward to seeing you all and having you all out on March the 5th at North Wandell College Prep Collins campus. So I want to thank um, Laura and our panelists. Um, we really appreciate uh, them being here to talk with us. Um, in the future, you can suggest panelists for future events to us, as well as questions uh, on the website, on social media. I want to thank the Logan Center, all of you guys for being a part of this discussion. And um, 
almost most importantly, I want to thank the candidates, the aldermanic candidates, the mayoral candidate, Commissioner Jesus Chuy Garcia, who came here just to listen to everyone. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, we're really excited to keep this conversation going and uh, have a good night.